Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I will be hanging out with you today as we continue on our series in ecology. Today, we're actually going to hop into some ecology. Topic is going to be abiotic factors behind the biomes. So let me get you your objectives, and we'll get going. By the end of this video, here are the things that I need you to know or be able to do. First up, discuss abiotic factors that shape the climate of an area. Recognize the general consequences of climate change and understand the concept of a biome. Now, before we even get into it, I'm going to warn you this might be a bit long, but if you've taken AP Environmental or something like that, it, it'll also be reviewed, so hopefully it won't be too hard. So first up, let's talk about what climate is. Climate is just long-term prevailing weather conditions in a given area. So what does that mean? Well, if you talk about weather, weather is what's going on right here, right now, or over the next couple days. Like today in Durham, I think it's going to be in the 50s, probably raining a little bit. And I think that's what it looks like for the rest of the week. So that is the climate. The, or sorry, that is the weather, forgive me. Short term is weather. Climate is long term. Usually I tell my students it's averaged over 30 years or so, but it's basically the long range outlook for what it's going to be like on March the 25th from year to year to year. So just recognize climate, long-term average, weather is what's happening right now. Now there are several fa factors that determine the climate of an area. And we're gonna go through those, but really most of them come back to the sun. It's all about the sun. So if we were talking about seasons, that has to do with the tilt of the earth related to the sun. If we're talking about wind patterns, that has to do with how the sun is heating up the surface of the earth. If we're talking about Ocean currents in relation to coastal climates, that is all going back to the sun and how it heats the water. So everything goes back to the sun when we're talking about climate, really, and life in general. Now, specific factors that actually determine the climate of an area are as follows. I'm going to go through a ton of them. First one is seasons. Hopefully this is one that you have interacted with a ton, but if you don't know it off the top of your head, know that our Earth is tilted at 23 0.5 degrees, which is really important because this is the whole reason we have our sun or our uh, seasons. You can see diagram here. The line around the middle is the equator. You got your sun shining solar radiation right here. And this is basically how it works. In this diagram right here, the southern hemisphere of the earth is pointed at the sun. So that means that they are having summer. We are having winter. Earth continues to rotate around the sun. At this point right here, neither hemisphere is pointed towards or away from the sun, so it is either spring or fall. Get over to this side, northern hemisphere is pointed at the sun. Southern hemisphere is pointed away from the sun, so we are having summer, they are having winter. And then right here we are back in between, both hemispheres are getting equal sun, so it's again either spring or fall. So that tilt of the earth determines whether it's spring for us, or fall, or summer, or winter. And recognize that our seasons are opposite of those in the southern hemisphere. When we're having winter, they're having summer, and vice versa. Next up, determiner of climate is going to be what latitude you live at. Now again, this goes back to the tilt of the earth and the way the sun's rays hit the earth. So you can see right here indicating that our earth is tilted at 23 and a half degrees. These lines right here represent solar radiation coming in. So if you are near the equator, the sun's rays are generally hitting the equator straight on all the time. So that is going to be the most intense solar radiation that you can get on earth. As you travel north or south of the equator, the sun's radiation gets deflected a little bit. So as it comes in, it's kind of hitting an area and spreading out over it. So if you're thinking of somebody punching you, this would be like straight on punch hitting you in the stomach. Right here, it's just kind of grazing off to the side. And as this solar radiation gets spread out across the surface of the earth, it imparts less radiation and thus heats up the land or the surrounding water less. So General rule, as you travel north or south of the equator, the solar radiation is less intense and therefore it's cooler. And the sun's radiation also goes into the idea of air circulation and wind patterns, which centers on this idea of a Hadley cell. Now, what a Hadley cell is, is the following. When air gets warm, it becomes less dense. Air that is less dense rises up. So at the equator, right here where the sun is hitting the earth with the strongest intensity 
actually, sorry, right here, where it's hitting with the strongest intensity, you can see you've got all of these cells that are made up of warm air rising. And then as that air cools down, it sinks back down towards the surface of the Earth, and it kind of moves in a circular fashion known as a Hadley cell. So you can see right here on the diagram of the Earth, all the way around the Earth, you have got Hadley cells where air is warming up and rising, then cooling and sinking back down. Now, a couple of important things to note about this. As this air warms up and rises, the higher it gets in the atmosphere, the cooler it gets, and as air cools down, it condenses. When it condenses, it forms rain. So this is the reason that the rainforests are found along the equator because along the equator is where the air is warming up and rising the most and as it rises up it dumps all that rain. Then when it gets to the top of its rise right here and it's dumped all of its rain it's really dry and it sinks back down to the earth so where you've got this dry air sinking back down towards the surface of the earth you get a desert because it's hitting the earth and it doesn't have any moisture along with it and then due to air pressure we're going to flow back to the center and we're going to do it all over again. So this right here in combination with the spinning of the earth is responsible for most of the major wind patterns that we see around the world. And we kind of see a similar thing going on with the oceans as well. Um, along the equator, again, you have got the most intense solar radiation, which just like air when water warms up, it rises up a little bit, becomes less dense. So you get a situation where at the equator, warm water rises up towards the surface, and then it starts to flow away from the equator, flows north and south from the equator. The spinning of the Earth causes our currents to move in a circular fashion, and generally what you get is warm water gets carried from the equator up the east coast of continents, and you can see that over here too, along Asia. It then travels up north towards the Arctic and then cool water, because the water comes and it gets cooled in the Arctic, cool water travels down the west coast of continents. And you see the same thing over here. And the reason this is important is it distributes heat energy throughout the world. So if we didn't have these currents, the equator would be much, much warmer and the northern and southern regions would be much, much cooler because you wouldn't have this warm water getting transported to different parts of the ocean. Also, this has a big effect on the climate in an area. So over here in California, you know, the climate is generally relatively cool because you've got cool water flowing down from Alaska along the coast. Right here along the east coast of America is generally warmer because you've got warm water flowing up from the equator. And then you've got mountains thrown in the mix. Um, there's an effect called the rain shadow effect. And here's a really crude diagram of it. But basically, the rain shadow effect works something like this. you got a body of water right here, usually an ocean. Wet air comes in off of the ocean, and it runs into a mountain range. Now, when it hits the mountain range, it is forced to rise up. And just like with the Hadley cell, when air rises up, it cools and condenses, and it drops rain. After it's dropped its rain, it can go over to the other side of the mountains and it cruises down the other side. And what you get is one side of the mountains are super dry, or super, sorry, super lush because all the rain has been dropped over here. And then the air that flows down the other side is super dry. So you'll have one side of your mountain range being super green, super lush, and the other side being desert dry. And that is the rain shadow effect. Now, what does climate change have to do all, with all this? We're going to do a whole chapter on this in a couple videos, but just for now, know that climate change affects all of these things. As it gets warmer, the patterns of air rising and falling get shifted, ocean currents get shifted, which ultimately affects all of the climates and the biomes around the world. So the Earth is kind of a balanced mechanism, kind of like a Swiss, Swiss watch, and as the uh, climate gets heated up, that's going to change the way that the watch works. So look for more on this topic later on. Two slides and we're going to finish up. Um, all of these things that we talked about determine the biomes of an area. Now a biome is an area that has got a specific temperature, precipitation, and vegetation pattern. And really it all goes down to the plants. The temperature and the precipitation determines which plants are able to live in an area. And then because of the food chain, the plants determine which animals are able to live in an area. So because of all the factors that we just talked about, seasons, latitude, air circulation, water circulation, you get the conditions that form the climate of a certain area. And then that climate determines the plants, which determines the animals. And we group those together into biomes. You can see the map there on the right. The colored sections are basically areas where specific biomes are found. And each of those biomes 
in some way or another can rely or be shaped by disturbances. Now, let's think of a big old forest with broadleaf trees. If there is a forest fire that comes through, clears out some of those trees, you're now going to have an area that is open, which is going to allow for the growth of new plant and uh, tree species. Um, there are some biomes like grasslands that rely on fire in order to uh, kind of survive and be healthy. Um, there are some areas that are used to flooding, so that is a disturbance that would maintain that habitat. Um, also, humans are probably the worst when it comes to disturbances, although most biomes are kind of tuned to handle natural disturbances. Humans don't bring natural disturbance. We put concrete over things and obviously plants and trees and stuff can't grow up through concrete. So we are a type of disturbance that the earth doesn't quite know how to deal with. And sorry if that video was a bit long, but I hope it helped you get a little better grasp on the abiotic, abiotic, non-living, the abiotic factors that determine the biomes of the world. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. We'll see you again.